if you're thinking, I've already seen the lecture on anatomy of the neck, uh, maybe you already have, because this is a re-recording of the lecture. The first time through, I didn't get the gestures recorded with the laser pointer correctly, so this is a revised version of the lecture. We're going to start with a discussion of the landmarks that you can use to orient yourself when you're looking at cross-sectional imaging of the neck. Then we're going to talk about the triangles of the neck that are defined by the major muscles of the neck that are used clinically to identify the locations of lesions. We'll talk about the anatomic fascia that divides the neck up and the spaces of the neck that are defined by these different fascial layers. Then we'll talk about the different mucosal regions and the names that are applied to them, which is another way of describing primary lesions that arise along the mucosa. The bulk of this lecture is going to be a discussion of lymph nodes, how we tell they're benign, how we tell they're malignant, how we categorize them, and how we describe their very predictable locations. We'll spend a little bit of time at the end talking about the anatomy of the brachial plexus and the anatomy of the larynx, although the pathology for those will be covered in different lectures. The landmarks that we use to orient ourselves when we're looking at cross-sectional imaging of the neck include the hyoid bone. Now, the hyoid bone is a keystone. Everything connects to the hyoid bone. Half of the muscles in the neck are hyo something. Everything seems to hook up to the hyoid bone. Interestingly, you can resect the hyoid bone without too much going wrong, uh, but it really is a linchpin. Everything seems to hook up at that point, the hyoid bone and the central neck. The thyroid cartilage is the cartilage that surrounds the larynx, the major cartilage surrounding the larynx. On cross-section, you've got to be able to distinguish between the hyoid bone and the thyroid cartilage at a glance to know where you are in the neck, whether you're up high near the hyoid bone or down low near the thyroid cartilage. Uh, the bottom of the neck is defined by the manubrium sterni, that is the very top edge of the sternum, which defines the thoracic inlet leading into the chest. This is a scout image from a CT of the neck. I've taken the liberty of highlighting a few of the critical structures in the upper neck, including the hyoid bone, which is in the anterior neck, just below the jaw the thyroid and cricoid cartilages that form the exterior boundaries of the larynx. And I've also darkened the laryngeal ventricle, which is an important reference point between the true and false vocal cords. This horizontal line that's drawn on the image runs through the T1 vertebral body. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, T1. The T1 vertebral body. The reason that I've drawn this line here is to emphasize the fact that the neck doesn't end at the first thoracic vertebral body. You've still got all of this neck soft tissue down here. That's because the thoracic inlet is oriented at this angle here. So just because you've hit the thoracic inlet in the back doesn't mean you've hit the thoracic inlet in the front, doesn't mean you're done looking at the neck. Our first landmark is the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone is in the central neck, relatively high up, we're just below the level of the jaw, and it has a smooth arched contour. The hyoid bone is composed of a central body and two greater cornua that extend posteriorly. There are also two lesser cornua that stick up vertically off of the top of the hyoid bone, right where the body meets the, the greater the cornua on each side. Uh, but th those are those are smaller cartilages. Where the body and the greater corno fuse, often they completely fuse, and there's no evidence that it really formed out of two parts embryologically. But sometimes in that fusion plane, you'll see a sclerotic line, like on this side. And sometimes you'll see a lucent line, or even a gap in the hyoid bone, where there is incomplete fusion of these parts. All of those are normal. Those are normal variants within the hyoid bone. I'm going to re-emphasize again this nice smooth arch that defines the hyoid bone.
This, in contrast, is the thyroid cartilage. There's no smooth arch out front. This thing comes to a point. So we describe the thyroid cartilage as steepled in front, steepled rather than smoothly arched. Now, you might ask yourself, why would I need that kind of help distinguishing a bone, the hyoid bone, from a cartilage, the, the thyroid cartilage? Isn't the bone going to be much more dense? Well, the cartilages of the larynx tend to ossify early in life in almost everybody, and so frequently by the time we are imaging these structures in adults, they already look like bones. And that's why you have such dense calcification throughout the visualized cartilages here, the thyroid cartilage out front like a shield, and the cricoid cartilage, which does form a complete ring if you look a little more inferiorly, but is larger in the back, uh, likened to a signet ring. So, hyoid bone, nice smooth arch, thyroid cartilage shown here, steepled in the front. Now let's look at the soft tissue anatomy of the neck with an emphasis on the muscles that are going to define the clinical anatomy of the neck as seen from the exterior. This is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It's a large muscle that sits along the lateral aspect of the neck and is easily palpated. It runs from just underneath the mastoid process behind the ear down obliquely across the lateral neck and originates from the medial clavicle and the sternum centrally in the, near the midline of the neck. This flat muscle across the back, this is the trapezius muscle. The trapezius muscle drapes like a cowl over the back of our neck and down over our shoulders. All right. The sternocleidomastoid muscle and trapezius muscle have in common that they are innervated by the spinal accessory nerve, the 11th cranial nerve. These muscles taken together are often called the paraspinal muscles. They have individual names. This is the levator scapulae muscle. Here are the longus coli muscles. But we take all of these muscles together, and it's convenient to refer to them as paraspinal muscles. They're all within one fascial sheath. It works. Now let's talk about the vessels. The more medial and usually smaller of the vessels is going to be the carotid artery. Because we're so low down in the neck, this is still the common carotid artery. Lateral to that is the internal jugular vein. The internal jugular vein, like most veins, is variable in size. In dehydrated patients, it might end up being smaller than its uh, carotid partner, but usually it's a little bit bigger. Here are the vertebral arteries in the foramen transversarium of the vertebral body. We know that this oval is the location of the cervical spinal cord. It's very hard on CT to distinguish between the cord itself and the surrounding CSF. Obviously, MRI and myelography are perfect for that distinction, but that's about where the spinal cord ought to be. Now let's take that muscular anatomy of the neck and apply it in a way that clinicians look at the neck when they're doing a physical examination. If we look at the arrangement of these different muscles, it divides the superficial neck into triangles, right? So here's the sternocleidomastoid muscle running obliquely across the lateral neck. Here's the trapezius muscle draped over the back. This muscle here is called the digastric muscle, so named because it has two bellies and a small tendon connecting them called the intergastric tendon. So the digastric muscle runs from the inner surface of the jaw, comes down, loops through a little fibrous pulley on the hyoid bone, here's the hyoid bone, and then returns up to insert on the mastoid process. So those two bellies are the anterior and posterior bellies of the digastric muscle. Down here we have another muscle with two bellies. I guess it's a digastric muscle, but it's not the digastric muscle. This is the omohyoid muscle. It has a superior and an inferior belly. The superior belly is part of those strap muscles that we talked about before that sit on top of the viscera. And the posterior belly heads back uh, at the bottom of the neck and inserts on the scapula 
Now that we've uh, now that we've defined the muscles, let's look at the triangles that they define. Here, in between the anterior bellies of the two digastric muscles, this is the submental triangle. If we move out a little more laterally, and we're between the anterior and posterior bellies of a single digastric muscle, we are in the submandibular triangle. The submandibular gland lives there. Submandibular lymph nodes live there. Now, if we come down uh, anterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, this is the carotid triangle, so named because this is where you can palpate the carotid pulse. If we go more medially, uh, medial to the superior belly of the omohyoid muscle, now we're in the muscular triangle. That's where the strap muscles are running down the front of the neck, covering up the viscera. That's why it's called the muscular triangle. Um, it's really sort of two triangles in one, if you look at that, uh, uh, at that shape. Sometimes we combine uh, number three and number four into, uh, into a triangle that we call the anterior triangle of the neck. That works pretty well because we're about to call this area right here the posterior triangle of the neck. So the posterior triangle of the neck lies between the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius muscle laterally in the neck. You can subdivide it into an occipital and subclavian triangle if you'd like, uh, but most people just prefer to this together as the posterior triangle of the neck. This is how clinicians view the neck. When someone says, oh, I felt a mass, they're going to try and put it into one of these triangles. And it's our job to translate this, this clinical anatomy into radiologic anatomy. So let's do that. To understand the radiologic anatomy of the neck, you first need to understand the fascia. The fascia of the neck, the cervical fascia, can be divided into superficial fascia and deep fascia. The superficial fascia just wraps everything in, in, in a big cylinder all the way around the outside. It encapsulates the platysma muscle. Anything superficial to the superficial cervical fascia is just subcutaneous tissue and dermis. Right? So we're talking about the skin and subcutaneous tissue outside of that, um, and that's it. Very superficial. Then inside of that is the deep cervical fascia, and that's a little more complex because the deep cervical fascia has multiple layers. Now, uh, the old way of naming these different layers are the deep, middle, and superficial layers of the deep cervical fascia. That's a little confusing, so I like the more modern terminology of investing visceral and prevertebral layers of the deep cervical fascia. Now, when we talk about these three layers, they sometimes send off little projections that combine in various ways to form the minor fascia that include things like the carotid sheath, the infrahyoid fascia, and the alar fascia, which we'll talk about in more detail. Let's see where these fascia are on a cross-sectional image of the neck. This is a T1-weighted MRI. Now, you can't see the fascia itself. It's too thin, but you've got to know where it lives anatomically because it's defining the spaces of the neck. Let's start with the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. The investing layer goes all the way around the neck uh, like a cylinder, it's just underneath the superficial cervical fascia. This is the investing layer, the deep cervical fascia. It, it, it separates to surround the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius muscle, so it encases those major muscle groups. Deep to that is the visceral layer of the deep cervical fascia. The visceral layer, sur layer surrounds the viscera. So that's really useful. Um, and in, at this level, we're surrounding the larynx. Notice that there's a little gap here between the visceral fascia and the investing fascia. And that's right where the strap muscles live. The strap muscles are surrounded by these layers of fascia. And we sometimes refer to that as the infrahyoid fascia. Now let's talk about the prevertebral layer of the deep cervical fascia. The prevertebral layer of the deep cervical fascia surrounds the entire spinal column and its associated paraspinal musculature. You might say, why don't we call this the paraspinal uh, fascia? I don't know why. We call it the prevertebral fascia, though, um, and, and it just surrounds the spinal material. 
Notice that there is a combination of all three layers of the deep cervical fascia that surround the internal carotid and internal carotid, or common carotid artery here and internal jugular vein. This is the carotid sheath. The carotid sheath is formed by these layers of the various deep cervical fascia. Now, something funny happens in the prevertebral fascia. It splits slightly to form the alar fascia. The alar fascia and the true prevertebral fascia leave a tiny space in between them. Let's look more closely at these fascia layers that lie between the larynx, the viscera in general, and the spine. These three layers of fascia, the visceral fascia, the alar fascia, and the true prevertebral fascia, those three layers divide, divide this area, this retropharyngeal space, into four potential spaces. The first, where the viscera is actually located, is called the visceral space. That makes sense. Things that arise here include masses arising from the thyroid gland to the parathyroid glands. Behind this is a bow tie shaped space in between the visceral fascia and the alar fascia that we call the true retropharyngeal space. And this is where you get retropharyngeal abscesses. But there's another space back here in between the alar fascia and the prevertebral fascia. This is the danger space of Holyoke and Grudinsky. This is dangerous because unlike these other spaces, an infection that achieves this space can run all the way from the skull base down to the diaphragm. That's the danger space. If we continue back, uh, we're in the paravertebral space within the confines of this true prevertebral fascia. So those are the four retropharyngeal spaces the visceral space, the true retropharyngeal space, the danger space, and the prevertebral space. When an, ida, when an object arises, when a mass arises in this location, it can be very difficult to distinguish between these four uh, spaces. Uh, but we'll talk about that in future lectures. So those fascia that we just talked about divide the neck into spaces and masses that arise in these particular spaces tend to be confined by the fascia and we can narrow our differential diagnosis if we know what their relationship is to that fascia if we know what space they occupy that's going to be the key thing in our differential diagnosis in the neck when we think about neck spaces we divide them into suprahyoid spaces superior to the hyoid bone and we'll talk about the parapharyngeal spaces and the submental and submandibular spaces which as you might expect correspond to the submental and submandibular triangles we'll also talk about the infrahyoid neck spaces um, in addition to the ones we've already talked about the superficial space that runs all the way around the neck and includes the skin and subdermis the visceral space that contains larynx, thyroid, pharynx, parathyroid, those things, and the neurovascular space, which is a combination of all the different fascia, but is also called the carotid sheath, and through it runs the uh, common carotid artery, internal carotid artery, internal jugular vein, and some very important nerves. Let's talk about the parapharyngeal spaces. This is probably the most important slide in the entire talk. It absolutely, completely influences our differential diagnosis when we are talking about suprahyoid neck masses. The key piece of anatomy to this discussion is this fat right here. This is the parapharyngeal fat. It's lying just lateral to the, the, the tonsils, medial to the jaw. If you can find this fat, that's going to be a critical reference point for you. When a mass arises here in the masticator space, and that's the masticator space that includes the jaw and the muscles of mastication, a mass that arises here is going to displace the parapharyngeal fat posteriorly and medially in this direction. Masses that arise in this location are usually infection.
If a mass arises in the lateral pharyngeal space where the, the, the palatine tonsil lives, a mass that arises there is going to displace the parapharyngeal fat laterally and a little bit posteriorly. It is generally tumors like lymphoma and squamous cell carcinoma that arise here. If a mass arises in the retropharyngeal space, it is going to displace the parapharyngeal fat anteriorly and laterally. Things that arise here uh, include uh, lymph nodes in the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. If a mass arises in the post-styloid parapharyngeal space, that here's the styloid process, so here we are in the post-styloid parapharyngeal space, it will displace the parapharyngeal fat anteriorly and a bit medially. Uh, this is where, this is the carotid sheath. Uh, sometimes people call this the carotid space for that reason. And, and uh, things that arise here tend to have arisen from uh, the vessels and the accompanying nerves. If a mass arises from the pre-styloid parapharyngeal space, there's the styloid process, here we are in front of that, that's pre-styloid. The pre-styloid parapharyngeal space, it will displace the parapharyngeal fat predominantly medially and maybe a little bit anteriorly. This is where the deep lobe of the parotid lives. Some people call this the parotid space. Um, and it is masses of the parotid gland that arise in this location. Let's apply what we've just learned about the parapharyngeal. Okay, here is a mass in a very similar location, but what's its relationship to the parapharyngeal fat? Here's the parapharyngeal fat on the normal side. There's the parapharyngeal fat being displaced predominantly anteriorly and a little bit laterally. Here, this is the direction of push, so we know that this arose more medially in the retropharyngeal space. Right? What lives in the retropharyngeal space? Lymph nodes live there. And so we're worried about things like lymphoma and metastases and occasionally the separated lymph node back here. Um, given this enhancement pattern, this sure has the look of a metastasis. And in fact, this is metastatic breast cancer. If you look carefully, it has a counterpart on the other side that hasn't quite displaced the parapharyngeal fat yet. Here's another suprahyoid neck mass. This is an unenhanced scan, so we're missing some clues, but we've still got that relationship to the parapharyngeal fat. Here's the parapharyngeal fat on the normal side. Here it is on the affected side. What's the relationship? Which direction is it pushing the fat? It's pushing it predominantly medially um, and maybe a little bit anteriorly. We said that that corresponds to the pre-styloid parapharyngeal space. Oh, look, there's the styloid and it's sitting right in front, the mass is sitting right in front of the styloid. That's a pretty good clue that you're in the pre-styloid parapharyngeal space. What arises from that space? This is parotid lesions. This is a pleomorphic adenoma arising from the deep lobe. Uh, the majority of parotid lesions are pleomorphic adenomas, and that is an even more overwhelming statistical likelihood in the deep lobe uh, versus the superficial lobe. Okay, here's a big mass, and it's in the suprahyoid neck. What's it doing to the parapharyngeal fat? Well, here's the parapharyngeal fat on the normal side. Here it is on the affected side, and this mass is pushing the fat predominantly medially and a little bit posteriorly. We said that that corresponds to the masticator space. This is a mass arising in the masticator space. You can see, in fact, that it is surrounding the jaw and it is, you know, that's, that's your clue that's arising from the masticator space. By far and away, the most likely thing to do this is infection. Infections are what uh, usually affect the masticator space, right? Uh, teeth are like that. So, is this, a, uh, is this an infection? Well, there's no inflammation of the overlying fat and there's erosion of the jaw that's way too big to be the um, mandibular foramen. So it's actually pretty destructive and aggressive mass. This, this is metastatic disease. This happens to be metastatic lung cancer uh, to the jaw. But usually, usually masses in this location are gonna be infection. Here's another superhyoid mass. How are we going to narrow our differential? We're going to look at the relationship to the parapharyngeal fat. Here's the parapharyngeal fat on the unaffected side. Here's the parapharyngeal fat on the affected side. Which way is it being displaced? 
Well, here's the mass. It's displacing it predominantly laterally, maybe a little bit posteriorly. That corresponds to the lateral pharyngeal space, where the tonsils live. Right? And there, in fact, is the tonsil, and this mass is deep to it, and it's got rim enhancement, so this is a periton peritonsillar abscess, right? Classic location um, and classic relationship to the, uh, to the tonsil overlying it. Um, and so uh, you, the other thing that we worry about in this location besides infection is tumor such as squamous cell carcinoma or sometimes lymphoma arising from the tonsil itself. This one's an infection, though. Sometimes we encounter a mass in an unusual location like this one here. This is a very superficial mass. How superficial? Well, I can see the platysma muscle here being displaced deep by this lesion. Superficial to the platysma muscle means superficial to the superficial cervical fascia, and that means that this had to arise from the dermis or the subcutaneous tissues. So uh, this is actually an, an, infectus, an infected sebaceous cyst. Here's a contrast enhanced fat suppressed T1MR. You might look at this and be inclined to say, oh, there's a big jugular vein. It's not the jugular vein. There's the jugular vein. There's the common carotid artery. This is a mass, right? So which space is this mass in? Well, let's look at its relationship to the vessels. It's sitting behind the common carotid artery and the jugular vein and kind of right in between them. Well, something runs right there. That's where we expect the vagus nerve to be running. This is a schwannoma of that vagus nerve, and we're going to put it, which space we're going to put it in, in the carotid sheath within the alar fascia. All right. If you want to see more examples of vagal schwannomas, uh, I recommend the uh, cranial nerve lectures. When squamous cell carcinoma arises in the head and neck, it's critically important to define which mucosal region it arose from because it has dramatic differences to the surgical approach and even to prognosis and to how the mass arose, what the, what the risk factors are for the mass. So we really want to define these different mucosal regions uh, clearly with clear boundaries. So we have the nasal cavity, which starts at the nares and goes back to the coena. We have the oral cavity, where the oral tongue lives. And then we have the pharynx, more posteriorly, that the nasal and oral cavities hook up with. And that can be divided into the nasopharynx superiorly, the oropharynx in the middle, and the hypopharynx on the bottom. So what are the anatomic boundaries that allow us to define these regions? A sagittal T1-weighted MRI is a great way to look at the anatomic structures of the midline neck. Let's start with this dark object here. This is the hard palate. It's dark around its cortical rim, uh, but it has bright signal centrally uh, from bone marrow. If we come back a little bit, we're in the soft palate here that extends from the hard palate and then droops backwards. At the very tip of the soft palate is the uvula hanging down. Sticking up here off of the larynx, this is the epiglottis, right? The epiglottis sticking up that's going to form the vallecula above and the vestibule below. We'll go into that anatomy in more detail later in the lecture. This is the sphenoid sinus sitting at the top of the clivus surrounding the pituitary gland black because it's full of air. And that's the clivus itself, the triangular bone that forms the central skull base. This whole area here is the larynx, and as I said, we're going to defer that anatomy in, until a little later in the lecture. This area here is called the base of tongue, and it can be a little confusing to distinguish between the oral tongue and the base of tongue, but they really are two very different anatomic regions with very different implications for pathology. The anterior two-thirds of the tongue here lives in the oral cavity, right, but the, and has a horizontal mucosal surface. 
But once you get to here, that mucosal surface takes a vertical turn. And this portion of the tongue that has a vertical mucosal surface, this posterior third, is called the base of tongue. And it's actually considered part of the oropharynx rather than part of the oral cavity. Now let's use those anatomic boundaries to define different mucosal regions in the head and neck. Let's start with the nasal cavity. The nasal cavity is bounded by the nose anteriorly in the nares. It's also bounded by the roof of the mouth, the hard palate, right? Uh, superiorly, it's bounded by the anterior skull base, cribriform plate, uh, fovea ethmoidalis, those things. And posteriorly, it is bounded by the coena. These are the gaps at the end of the nasal septum. Once there's no more septum, you've transitioned from the nasal cavity back into the nasopharynx. Below that is the oral cavity. Uh, the oral cavity is bounded by the palate, both the hard and soft palate. It's bounded by the teeth anteriorly and the jaw below that. It's bounded inferiorly by the mylohyoid muscle, very important muscle that forms the, uh, the boundary between the oral cavity above and the neck below. It's a sling-like muscle that runs from one side of the jaw to the other and supports the tongue and, and forms this boundary. Posteriorly, we, uh, the, the anterior two-thirds of the tongue are considered oral cavity, and the posterior third is the base of tongue. Now the different parts of the pharynx. We'll start up at the nasopharynx superiorly. The nasopharynx uh, starts when the nasal cavity ends at the coena. It's bounded by the rest of the uh, middle skull base and by the spinal column. Uh, its boundary uh, superiorly includes the clivus, uh, and its boundary inferiorly includes the soft palate. By the time you get to the tip of the uvula, that's the end of the nasopharynx. Once you pass the soft palate, pass the uvula, you're going to be down in the oropharynx. This is the oropharynx. Notice that the oropharynx, importantly, includes the base of tongue. And it extends only down until you reach the epiglottis. Once you've passed the epiglottis, then you're going to be down in the hypopharynx. Here's the hypopharynx. Uh, it includes the portions of the pharynx that are below the level of the epiglottis. It looks like there's not much going on here, uh, but in fact, that's because we're in the midline. Remember that the piriform sinuses are off on either side here, and those are also part of the hypopharynx. The only part I can show here on this midline image is the postcricoid portion of the, uh, of the hypopharynx, but there's more on either side. The, the hypopharynx continues down until you reach the cricopharyngeus muscle, which is called the upper esophageal sphincter, and that is the esophageal verge. Once you're past that, you are in the cervical esophagus. That ends the portion of the lecture on landmarks, fascia, and spaces. We'll move on next to cervical nodes.